have you all here. Thank you. In my mid-20s and late 20s, I started to do quite a lot of personal growth work. And I was also attracting a lot of other people that were doing the same work. And I would say in general, I thought that was a pretty good supportive experience, but I did notice that there would, would be, you know, someone would be talking about the work they were doing, and, and another person would be talking about the work they were doing, and then I'd share about the work that I was doing. And it seemed to me we were all in different places. And there was even a sense that maybe the work they were doing might be more important than the work was, that I was doing. Have you ever felt like that? Anybody else here in Unity? There's a little bit of ego in there. Like everybody's saying, you just have to do this. Well, fortunately, I was able to stay true to myself and my own path and do the work that I knew that was right in front of me. But I'm also really grateful that, you know, I was asking the question that in that time when I was talking with other people that I was wondering if I was like doing growth wrong because somebody else was doing something else. You know, can you do growth wrong? Well, the answer to that is no. Obviously not. We all have our own journey. So I was very excited when I found what I call my first map of the human condition. And I was acknowledging the fact that there are four different sectors in which human beings grow. And I've shared this with you before. Um, it, this is a very simple version, and I'm going to add to it today. So we grow mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I noticed, you know, in my 20s and 30s that I was kind of jumping around between these different sections, and even realizing that I had to do growth work in one section, maybe before I could even do growth work in another. They're all interconnected. They're not independent. And then in my mid, I would say mid 40s, I discovered the work of Ken Wilber, who's a philosopher, I think one of the most brilliant of our time, and he brought in um, four different areas that we need to be working with in these sectors that match the work that I was already doing. And so the first area is we have to grow up, and that, ex that affects the areas of mental and physical growth. And then the next area is emotionally we have to clean up. And Charles and Myrtle Filmer would even say that probably goes into the mental section as well because we need to clean up our thinking. And then spiritually, we need to wake up and we're doing all of this work within ourselves so that we can bring our Christ self forward into the world, not only in our own lives, but in the world as well. And for that, in that sense, we all need to show up in the world. So I'm starting a four-part series today, and I'm wanting to dive deeply into each one of these different areas and share really some of the major key areas that I've noticed in my own life as I've done growth work, and hoping that maybe that will open you up to, you know, what maybe what's your own path, maybe different than mine, but still gives you permission to jump right in and do the work that needs to be done. So. I'm starting with I am growing up today, and when we talk about growing up, Ken Wilber talks a lot about developmental lines. There are as many as you know, 13 developmental lines of growth that we need to tap into, and this is an example of just four of them. Cognitive development, what am I aware of? Needs, what do I need? Emotional development, how do I feel about this? And interpersonal, how should we interact? That's just a sampling to give you an experience of what these lines are. Now, there are researchers that are connected to each one of these questions. And these basically, many of them have maybe one or two or three different people that you would recognize the names of, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, what we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, but these researchers spent the majority of their lives looking at these stage development and describing what it was that human beings were doing to get from one stage to the next. So here we go with Maslow. I won't talk about this much. I know many of us have st studied this in school. We start at the bottom with, psycho, um, with our needs of basic needs of food, water, um, air, shelter. We need to know that we will be provided for in the earth. And then once we've established that, that helps us go to the next stage, which is is safety and security. It's important to recognize that we can't go from to the second stage until we are completed the first, and we bring the first stage with us in that process, and it just keeps on moving up. This particular chart shows that self-actualization is at the highest level, and there's actually been levels added that show that spirituality is the highest now. 
I think the important thing that I want you to rec also recognize this is this is what is a real example of transformation is. When we talk about the word transformation, we're talking about this change that happens within us as we go to the next stage of development. So the most important developmental line in our life is cognitive development, and this is about our own brain development. We have to have a functioning brain to be an adult human. Important to recognize that by age 12, this is when we have an ability to have abstract thinking and deductive logic. So up to the age of 12 or 13, around there, we're still a kid. We don't function in the world like we're an adult. And then I also like how the work of Robert Keegan, he took this a little bit further. I'm going to talk about orders of mind, which is another developmental line. Oops. Sorry, there we go, orders of mind. So in stage one, it says um, that is the imp impulsive mind. That's about early childhood. Stage two is the imperial mind. That's about adolescence. And I have some percentages here of the population. That's maybe 6% of the population. Notice that individuals view the people as a means to get their own needs met at this stage. Now, that's a normal part of our human growth. But keep in mind, there are some, still, still some adults that are at this stage. So you know, kind of listen in and hope that you've really moved beyond this. The next one is stage three, where there's quite a large number of our population that are at the socialized mind, 58%. The most important things are about ideas, beliefs, and morals from our family and our culture. So at this stage, we're looking out to the world to help define ourselves. We're not looking within. And it says that we do look for external validation. So for instance, you know, if I was taking a math test and I feel like I had mastered the material, um, it was not, being not, not enough for me to acknowledge that I'd mastered the material. I would need to get the A on the test to tell me that I had mastered the material. And at this point in time, we also don't have an independent, strong sense of self. So you might already know what the next level is. I'm guessing many people in this church are in this space. The self-authoring mind, this is 35% of the population, which I actually think is quite a large number. So at this stage, we can define who we are and not be defined by other people, our relationships, or the environment. We develop an internal sense of direction and a capacity to create and follow our own course. And we realize that we are always changing. Now, when I saw this, this jump from stage three and stage four in order, orders of mind, it reminded me of the work that Charles and Myrtle Fillmore have done in Unity Churches. And back in their day, late 1800s, early 1900s, they were always encouraging people to think for themselves. That was part of their mission. I'm convinced that they were quite pioneering in the fact that they were suggesting and encouraging people to come from a consciousness of stage four when they were here on Earth. Now stage five, there's only a small percentage of people that are at this space. One sense of self is not tied to any identity or role. One's identity is a constant flux and ever changing. So we not only can kind of question authority, but we can also question ourselves. Wow, isn't that profound? And we can understand from many different perspectives. There are a lot of people that say this is, this is what we need in the world today to help um, move on from all the conflict that we're seeing in the world. If we can see from other perspectives, then there's no reason to be in conflict because where everybody is can be okay. So I added in what I call a psychograph, and this is a very small model. Notice that I put three different uh, developmental lines on this, and I have cognitive, orders of mind, and morals I added in. And what we can do in our own development, I mentioned there's like 13 of these developmental lines, we can do this for ourselves, and we can study and figure out where we are in each different level, stage development. So in my example that's on the overhead, I have cognitive development for someone at like fifth stage, so they're um, very advanced and maybe very smart as well. Uh, I mean, it orders of mind, this person is at the third level, so they would be looking to the outside culture for who they are. And in moral development, you can make some assumptions about what that means. I'll be talking more about that in a minute. But this person would be at a very low level of moral development. Well, in my own life, 
um, I was somewhat appalled when I started to learn about some of the things that happened um, during the Nazi occupation of Germany and the fact that people were deliberately harming other people and it was very intelligent people that were doing this and I was puzzled, you know, how can that be? Well, this explains that. So some of these people that were hurting others maybe had high cognitive development, but the, in the order of mind they were still looking to their community um, for who they were and ethically, morally, they were making decisions that were not a very high level of consciousness at all. Another example of this, um, just to kind of shift that energy a bit, so if you moved someone to a higher order of mind where they were looking within, and you also moved their moral stage development much higher, this might be an example of someone in the United States that perhaps is a Supreme Court judge, someone like that. So that you can see that their development that they have done will show up in how they're presenting themselves in the world. Some other developmental lines, I'm not gonna read all the questions here, but a lot of people are curious about what they are. So intrapersonal, kinesthetic, there's actually a separate spirituality line which I'll be diving more into when I talk about waking up. Aesthetics, volition, and I mentioned morals. Now, I do want to talk a little bit more about morals. And this is the work of Kohlberg, Lawrence Kohlberg. And you can see this is another way to present visually the information in stage growth. So at the bottom, you'll notice that it's about punishment and obedience. So that's your motivation for morals. That's why you're doing things morally. The next stage up is about what well, says here, instrumental purpose. That really means that they're reward motivated. So if you get a reward, then that's what you're gonna do. The third one is you wanna be a good boy or a nice girl, and then you're all about law and order. The next stage up is social contract. I have a look at this one out. This is more about justice and, and seeing that there's justice in the world. And then the, the highest one is universal ethical principle. So what's interesting about these stages when you learn about them in each different developmental line is that you can see where you have been in your own growth process. You can look behind and see where you've been. It's harder to look forward into what your next step is because you don't know what that looks like yet. And typically when people first hear about this stage development, they are guessing that they're higher than they really are. So if you're studying this, really take some time to figure out where you're really at. It is our human nature. So there is something that I wanted to share. So, let me show you a picture of Ken Wilber here. He's um, really responsible for a lot of this work that's helping us map, create this bigger map in the world. And I brought some resources if you're interested, if you're a reader. One of these books is Integral Spirituality. It reads a little like a textbook, but I think it's easy enough for most people to understand. And then when this came out, people were saying, well, this is so profound. Can you make something, you know, your concepts are great, but can you make it easier to understand? And so he came out with this book, which I actually recommend the most, I think. It's, it's a great big prints and lots of pictures, and it helped explain <laughs> what he's doing, and, and I, just, I just love the book, The Integral Vision. I recommend that. And then also the last one is Integral Life Practice. So once we identify that there's all these different sectors and areas where we can grow, we really need to step into practice in terms of, you know, what is the work that we're going to do so we can grow. So those are all resources for you if you're interested in checking those out. I'll give you an example of one of the practices. Not all the practices are difficult. They can be very simple. So I want to do a little motivation practice with you. So center yourselves and put your hand over your heart. This will be a very short, reflective time to look within yourself. I want you to think about something that you want to create in your life, something that you want to bring forward, some real desire that you have, something that is on your heart that you want to create. So when you come up with what that is, I want you to think about what is my real motivation for why I want that. And it might take some thinking. Can you tap into that energy? What is my real motivation? And if you're struggling with figuring out what the motivation is, see if you can imagine yourself in that space of having accomplished what you wanted to bring forward. And if you can be a witness to yourself in, in who you are and what you're doing, kind of like a little celebration. So if you can focus in on that, then can you resonate with what was the reason, what was your motivation originally to do what you wanted to do? Understanding our motivation 
is incredibly important as we step forward in the things that we do in the world. So go ahead and bring yourself back. And just keep that little idea in mind. I'll come back to that in a bit. Well, I want each of us to do the work of uh, individual development growth work. I do think it is important that each of us look at the overall human condition or experience, if you'd like that word better, of what it is for us to grow. So many years ago, theologian Thomas Keating, he gave a couple lectures at Harvard School of Divinity, and Thomas Keating is actually Catholic. And so it's interesting to me that um, his ideas, in a sense, are merging with some of the things that we're doing here in your Unity today. I'm always looking for that bridge and the information that I bring forward. Um, there is a congruency, and I want you to hear that. So this little book that he wrote called The Human Condition that came out of his lectures. It's tiny. And I actually I have a picture here. This is it, The Human Condition. It's only 38 pages. It's actually big print as well. But he got right to the core of what the issues are in our life that we're working through that's part of being human. And it comes down to two basic questions. He said in the first part of our life, we're working one question. And in the second part of our life, we're working in the second one. And the questions are, where are you? and who am I? So where are you is what I'm going to dive into first. And it says, where, I, where am I in relationship to God, to myself, and to others? So when I merge this question with the developmental lines that I've been talking about, Keating says most people spend decades starting at birth dealing with three primary issues. The issues are security and survival, power and control, and affection and esteem. These are all legitimate needs that human beings have. So the quicker you get these needs met, basically, the quicker you can move on to something more productive. That's basically what's being shared. But we may spend a whole lifetime working on figuring out to get, how to get these needs met. He says that while we're all dealing with this stuff, Keating says that what we are all really seeking is happiness. So look at all the kids in the bottom. They seem to know directly what that is. He says, metaphysics and the religions of the world have discovered the insight that human beings are designed for unlimited happiness, the enjoyment of all truth and love without end. The spiritual hunger is part of our nature and begins, and I'm sorry, and as, I'm sorry, let me repeat that. The spiritual hunger is part of our nature as beings with a spiritual dimension. So here we are with an unbounded desire for happiness and not the slightest idea of where to look for it. Okay, so remember that that full self-reflective cognitive development awareness that I was talking about begins at around age 12. Keating says that with no practical experience of the presence of the divine within us, adolescents look for happiness somewhere else. And this is called... His compensation is the term that he gives this. Children who are deprived of security, affection, and control needs develop a desperate drive to find more and more symbols of these basic human needs in their culture. So again, they're looking outside instead of inside for the gold that exists. And what this means, of course, is that adolescents and young adults are trying to fill a void. These two forces of striving for happiness and over-identification with one's immediate culture create a challenge that seems to be uh, the beginning of the human condition for every single one of us. And that leads to our addictive process, which is basically what Keating acknowledges is going on within all of us as well. He says... Here then is the beginning of what might be called the addictive process, the need to hide the pain that we suffered in early life and cannot face. We repress it into the unconscious to provide an apparent freedom from the pain or develop compensatory processes to access forms of pleasure that offset the pain we are not yet prepared to face. And I listed or put some pictures up on the overhead. You know, it could be alcohol, could be food, um, could be gaming, whether gambling or video games and shopping. I mean, the list is endless. We know what those things are. And it's all about stuff out there and avoiding our pain rather than diving deeply and healing and harnessing the Christ that's within ourselves. 
So Keating says that when experiences in early childhood are so unbearable, they are repressed into the unconscious. And from that standpoint, our body, the physical body, becomes so important. The body seems to be a kind of warehouse in which all of our experiences, the whole of our lives, are recorded. The buried pain that we cannot face is the birth of what Keating calls the homemade self or the false self. And we do talk about that quite often in unity. There's a false self and a true self. And the truth self is our divine nature, the Christ within. So... Let me share this. He, I'm talking mostly about the false self now. He says the false self is deeply entrenched. You can change your name and address, religion, country, and your clothes. But as long as you don't ask it to change, the false self simply adjusts to the new environment. And he gives an example from his own life. He says, for example, instead of drinking your friends under the table as a significant sign of self-worth and esteem, if you enter a monastery, as I did, fasting the other monks under the table could become your new path to glory. <laughs> so in that case, what would have changed? Absolutely nothing. So this is why we need the awareness and consciousness to see what we're doing on our path. I'll be talking more about that false self, true self dynamic in future talks in this particular series. But for right now, if you're identifying with that false self, I just ask that when you're aware that it shows up to be peaceful about it. Um, this is the human condition and there is a path to grow out of that identification. You know, if you're willing to do your own personal work, which is why I'm talking about this, you know, it may not go away, probably won't, but it will show up less. I can guarantee that. So, in my own personal journey, I had to put in a picture of myself today with my mom. It's my mom and my oldest sister, Jamie, I'm in the middle. And, yeah, oh, I thought that too when I was looking for pictures. But good memories. I think it was taken in the late 1960s. So, in my own journey of growing up, I noticed something early on. As a kid, I looked to my parents to show me the way to grow. But eventually, I had to find new role models and mentors. You know, somewhere in my own growth process, I realized that different generations also have different key issues that they are dealing with. And it does, take an, or it does make an impact in terms of how we do our developmental work and in what order. You remember I was talking about the different people when I first started sharing today. You know, different people would be doing different work, and I was like, why is that? Why can't we all just be on the same path and do the same thing at the same time? Well, we're all individual. We all have our own path to figure out. So I think this is profound that in this understanding that there, I've noticed three key issues that people are dealing with. This is part of cleaning up, but also part of our growing up. And I want to share them. So the first one is, in generational issues, this is about survival. So survival was not an issue for my, my parents, but it was for my grandparents. And it's despite being both an electrical and chemical engineer, my grandfather on my dad's side had a tough time getting a job. I, I don't know this whole story around this, but he did not serve in the war, and he worked in a time when veterans were coming back from the war, and those veterans got the jobs. So despite the fact that he was highly educated, um, he could not get a job, and he struggled with that as a major part of his, his life. You know, I can't even imagine how difficult it must have been for him to live during that time, and even to, to develop any real sense of self-esteem, you know, when he was struggling with that issue. And this is also the energy that the Unity founders, Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, were living in. You know, it's no wonder that so much of their teaching focused about prosperity. You know, there's a coordinate for survival and financial prosperity that existed during that time. And they were speaking to that in so many different levels. And even using helping people harness their own inner spirituality to move through some of those issues. So does anybody have a guess on what the second generational issue might be? No, no, no brave souls. The next one is emotional intelligence. Okay, we've been hearing a lot about this maybe in the last five to 10 years. This, this is also a developmental line. You know, my parents experienced a lot of financial prosperity, both having gone to college and my dad getting a job at Hallmark Cards, which was you know, really a great place to work uh, in his day. One would think that with, you know, out having to deal with those financial issues every single day, that life would get easier, right? 
Well, not necessarily, okay? Because studies show that as we develop through to new stages, our challenges don't disappear. They just become different, okay? So for my parents, that meant learning about emotional intelligence. I do credit my dad for being brave enough to do therapy in the 1970s. You know, there was all kinds of stigma about that. You know, people thought you were crazy if you ever stepped into that arena. And for, fortunately, people have gotten smart enough um, that I don't think therapy has the stigma today that it did then. And let me know, I want to share with you that the, the healthiest people that I know have all done therapy. So let's just support each other in doing that work. And my mom also met with success by working a 12-step program. That was a lot of that of emotional intelligence for her. And I've also continued my own work in this area. What my parents couldn't teach me, I've had to learn on my own, and I have had to dive deeply into what exactly this means. Just in general, I'll talk about emotional intelligence in another part of the series, but briefly, if you don't know what that is, we're talking about our feelings and understanding them. We need to know our emotions. We need to be able to manage our emotions. We need to be able to motivate ourselves. We need to be able to handle relationships. And we need to be able to recognize emotions and others. And bottom line, if, if I can't recognize my own emotions, you know, how in the world can I share that with other people and be in relationship with them? So this first step is really to recognize your own emotions and put a name to them. As I mentioned, emotional intelligence is a developmental line, and Daniel Goleman is the person that's done so much research on that. And if you're interested in exploring that, he has a book called Working with Emotional Intelligence that I think is even better than his first book. He, he gets more um, specific about the work that you can do in that area. Okay, so I remember sitting in a therapy session with this like epiphany that happened, recognizing that these survival needs were going on in previous generations of my family, and then emotional intelligence issues were going on in the culture, things I had to learn. And then I asked one of my mentors and therapists, um, his name is Reverend Dr. Alan Gatewood. He is brilliant. He's a theologian and also a therapist. And I asked him, you know, there's another issue. What's the next issue? Because I have kids, and I'm, I'm wondering what they're going to be dealing with. Does anybody know what the next issue is or want to guess? Well, it, that's a piece of it, but as far as the big issue that we need to deal with for this generation is entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we know it when we see it. So Dr. John Townsend says entitlement involves two distinct issues. I am exempt from responsibility and I am owed special treatment. So this is a much bigger issue that I actually want to get into today, but I do think it's, <laughs> yeah. Much bigger. I think we need to be able to recognize entitlement when we see it. You know, in a talk at Saddleback Church, Townsend shared a story about to identify maybe a way that we could see what entitlement is. And there was a man that went in for an interview. And the interview was supposed to be 40 minutes. And the man, um, after 20 minutes, the interviewer said, well, I don't think that you're fit for this job. And I, you know, I think we'll close the interview here. And, and the person interviewing got upset. He said, well, I thought this interview was supposed to be 40 minutes long. And the interviewer said, well, sir, you've been texting on your phone while during this entire interview. So I'm assuming that you're not um, that interested in this position. And so do you really, this man really thought that he might get the job interviewing if he was texting? So again, it's an example of entitlement. So by sharing these generational issues, you know, I just want you to be aware that some folks that you know are in that survival space. I recognize that uh, my, my, one of my sons was dating a girl in high school, and her family, there were four children between the ages of like eight and 20, the oldest 20 year old had two children, and the parents were uh, doing blue collar jobs and working hard in the world, and I was just really caught up in looking at how much they were still into surviving with so many kids. And, and the jobs that they had. It's harder to do the emotional intelligence work when you don't have those survival issues met. So some of us are blessed. If you're in a place where you're, where you're feeling good about your occupation and your income, that can certainly help you to do this work in a really super big way. I still think that most of us are still work, doing work to master emotional intelligence, and our younger generation in particular certainly has the um, entitlement issues. So. As I, there's another small model that I want to share in growing up 
And I may have shared this before, but I want you to be aware of something with it. Um, so from birth to adolescence, life is all about me. Uh, remember, I also have teenage boys at home, uh, now 16 and 18. And I often think, oh my goodness, was I ever that self-involved? You know, and the answer is yes, we all were. So probably I'm amazed that so many adults that were at this space today. Okay, so let's honor people where they're at, encourage them to grow. So if you can at least bring your, your stage development up to the next notch where it's not just all about me, but it's about us, your family, the community. If you can at least get there, that's a super big help. And we see this going on in all the different developmental lines. So you mean it may be in a different space on this stage development and the developmental lines. You may be at a lower space on one and a higher on another. Just so that that is um, figuring where you are is part of your work. So ultimately, we do want to go beyond our own personal space in our community and to see that bigger picture that we were all part of, not only our community, but the Earth and our entire planet. It includes all of us. And finally, I do want to really offer my thanks for those of you who have made a super big commitment to do your own personal growth work. You are not only helping yourself, but you are serving every single person here when you step in and do this work. When one person learns and changes, there's this incredible ripple effect that happens and it goes out far beyond what the eye can see. So your consciousness, your transformation from one stage to the next has an ability to change your consciousness and it can change the consciousness of every single person around you, including every person here in this church. So thank you for your dedication, for being willing to grow. I'll be continuing with this series through May and June. And the next one is on May 26 and I'll be talking about cleaning up. So God bless and just I honor you in doing your work. Thank you.